vast crowds. Open in your Bibles real quick. i uh, got about 17 minutes. Sure. <laughs> Exodus chapter 15, verse 22 through 25. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Mara. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Some, some say tree, some versions. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made a decree and a law for them. And there he tested them. What do we do when we come to those bitter pools in life? Those bitter moments in life. How do we handle them? What, what do we do with them? That is what we're looking at here. There's a little poem, a little story about an oyster. And I want you to hear this. There was once an oyster whose story I tell, who found that sand had got under his shell. Just one little grain, but it gave him much pain. For oysters have feeling, although they're so plain. Now, did he berate the working of fate, which had led him to such a deplorable state? Did he curse the government, call for an election? No. As he lay on the shelf, he said to himself, If I cannot remove it, I'll try to improve it. So the years rolled by, as years always do, and he came to his ultimate destiny, stew. And this small grain of sand, which had bothered him so, was a beautiful pearl all richly aglow. Now this tale has a moral, for isn't it grand what an oyster can do with just a morsel of sand? What could we do if we'd only begin with all the things that get under our skin? Those things that get under our skin that would, if left to itself, would make us bitter. How do we handle that? How, how do we treat those things? First of all, Israel was fresh from a tremendous spiritual victory. That's when your most trying moments will come. Right after the great victory, Satan will try to distract you or knock you off your feet. They had been delivered from slavery. They had been given a new life. And they had witnessed God destroying the enemies in, in the Red Sea. If somebody here today has had that great victory and then suddenly something happened and you were faced with that bitter moment, that bitter pool, and you're going through a trial today, then I've got a, just a couple of things to say to you. In these verses, you're going to learn some great lessons. And I encourage you not to miss. Because if everything in your life is sailing smoothly, it won't be long until you reach that bitter pool. But if you're standing at it right now, 
there, there's hope and there's help and there's blessing that you can receive. The lessons that we've learned from this place called Mara, life's bitter pool, starts out like this. There's some lessons there about life. Number one, life is a mixture, and we covered these last week. Israel had just experienced a blessing, and now they were experiencing the bitter, that the good had come, and now the not-so-good was facing them. Like a lot of people today, they assume that once you are following the Lord, everything's cool, jacked up, feeling great. Just thought I'd throw that in. You know, you have to relate to that younger crowd. <laughs> the lessons are worth remembering. While everything might seem depressing, we, we have to be aware that the good moment, the blessing moment, that moment when God steps in, it's on its way. And all we have to do is make it through this bitter moment. It takes two mountains to make a valley. And, and we're on our way up another mountain. God is going to make sure that we receive everything that we have need of. But life is a mixture. And it's how we handle those things, how we think about those things, how we impact and let them impact us will make the difference in whether we make it through or we just turn bitter ourselves. The second thing was life has a master. When Israel arrived at Marah, they seemed to forget all the wonderful things that God did for them. They forgot about the deliverances and the plagues and the miracles that, that, that God had blessed them with. They forgot that up until that time, the Lord had been absolutely in control, leading them, directing them, guiding them every step of the way. They forgot that God was master. You know, it was his idea that they go to this bitter pool. It was the Holy Spirit in the cloud and in the, that was leading and they got there. God wasn't shocked. God was already prepared. And you'll see more about that shortly. Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work together for good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Life has a ministry. God used these times, both good and bad, to minister to the Israelites, he does the same for us. What they learned about God in both these times begin to shape their perception, their thoughts, their knowledge about who God is, how powerful he is, what he can do and what he can supply. Every situation in life serves as ministry of the Lord to us. Those things that happen to us daily, God is crying out through those things. I love you. I care about you. I'll supply for you. If we'll just listen, take a moment, spend a little time, hear what God has to say. God is simply trying to make us more like his son. Sometimes some rough ed edges need to be knocked off. That's not fun. Sometimes there needs to be some sanding done. That's not fun. Sometimes we need to be molded and melted. That's not fun. You look at Elijah and his travels. He was down by the brook Cherith. You know what that means? Cherith means the cutting place. So there were some things in Elijah's life that needed to be trimmed off. He needed to be brought down to size. So God put him at Cherith. 
had ravens come and feed him. He drank from the brook. What happened? The brook dried up. Did God send him to a palace, to a beautiful place? No. Said, I got a widow prepared for you, and she's about to die. She's picking up two sticks to cook a biscuit for her and her son, and then she's going to die. So you go down and stay with her. Sure. But he did. He went down to Zarephath. You know what Zarephath means? The melting place. There was some molding that needed to be done. So he, he, he had to face the adversity. Number one, he had to walk all the way across the desert with no water, no food. To get to the widow's house. And he saw her, and she was picking up two sticks. She had two, two sticks, not two bundles, two sticks. You don't make much of a fire with two sticks. But that's all she had. He said, make me one first. There was some, some, some molding and melting that had to take place. Because the moment was coming when he was going to have to step up to the plate. The same is true for us. The same was true for Israel. God is making us more like his son. And sometimes that doesn't feel too good. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13. This is his goal until we all reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, buddy, that's a mouthful. That's not easy. So there's some lessons about themselves that was there, and that's point number two, some lessons about themselves. You know, sometimes we need to learn a little bit about us. Sometimes you need to step back and do a little introspection. Find out what's going on in your own heart. Find out how good you're, you're, you're following and ministering. Because sometimes we get a little selfish. like a giant laboratory. That's what was going on. They were in the wilderness, brought out of Egypt, and God was letting them see themselves. Their experience, every experience that they had, whether good or bad, began to x-ray their heart because that's what was shown does the same thing for us. What are you going to do when the bitter moment comes? What are you go how are you going to respond? You're going to punch somebody out? I don't like you, boo. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> it's not quite the way that God, God intends us to react. But there's a an experiment going on, an x-ray that's being taken and it's revealing us to us. God is putting his finger on some things. I pray a prayer ever so often and I've heard some of you pray something similar. I said, God, if there's anything in my life, just put your finger on it. Be ready if you ask that. Because he's going to, all five of them, and the other hand too. And then it's up to you. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to react to it? You're going to learn a lot about yourself when the bottom falls out. That bitter time of Mara reveals certain characteristics about these Israelis. 
some that they probably would rather not have known. You know, there's some things that we don't want somebody to tell us. Be, be careful if somebody walks up and says, I trust you. Tell me like it is. Do I get on your nerves? Well, as a matter of fact, you do. I can't stand you. <laughs> they, they will hurt you. I'm telling you. There's some things that we don't want to know. There's some things that we want you to lie to us about. But God won't do that. His mirror is perfect. It shows every flaw, but it shows every blessing too. It shows everything just like it is. Some of us are guilty just like they were of having some characteristics that it'd probably be better if we didn't have. They learned something. The first thing that they learned was they were living for themselves. They were living for self. Nobody in this room wants to hear you're selfish. We don't want to hear it. So we made another phrase. It's all about me. And we make a joke out of it, but it's true. Some of us sitting in here right now, it's all about me. I don't care what happens to you, it's all about me. As long as I'm happy and I'm comfortable and I'm doing what I want to do. And that's, that's the way we gauge happiness. And if it's somewhere other than that, then we're not happy. And we let everybody know it. Israel was living for self. They were only concerned with their personal satisfaction. Forgotten were all the great things that God had just done in their lives. Forgotten was all the miracles that God had performed for them. Instead of being filled with wonder and glory and worship, they were totally consumed with their own personal needs. For some of us, that probably sounds familiar. Sometimes when we get into a tight spot, we seem to forget all the greatness of God. And, and our world suddenly becomes very small. It has one letter in it, and it's I. We tighten our boundaries, and we live our own lives until that centerpiece and the force of every thought, the force of every motive is what I want. Newsflash. We need to remember that God doesn't want us living for ourselves or for our selfish needs. He says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Paul said, when I'm in Rome, I'll do as the Romans do. I'll be all things to all men that I might thereby win some of them to Jesus Christ. Jesus, more than anything else, desires that we'll live for him. That we'll let him live in us. He desires that we put him first. And when we live for him, when we do those things, he's promised to take care of every trial, every situation, every problem of life, every need that you bump up against. He said he'll take care of it. 
if we'll put him first. You say, well, pastor, how, how, how do you know that? Because I've read Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I know what it says. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. If you want to know what things, go to chapter 6 and read all the things that he had listed there. All these things will be given you as well. So you'll have his blessing. You'll have his glory. And you'll have every need met. That's what he's saying. But in order for that to happen, we put him first. Not us first. They were living for self. Why were they living for self? Because they were walking by sight. That's point two or B. They were walking by sight. Israel was guilty of looking for satisfaction in the world that's around them instead of to God who had bought them. They had sold themselves into slavery. When the brothers sold Joseph into slavery, he sold the, they sold the nation into slavery. God had bought them just as he's bought you. It was that innocent lamb that was slain and the blood was spread upon the doorpost that the angel of death, as he moved through Egypt, would see the blood and pass over them. The lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, his blood was shed and spread on Calvary. And when you and I cling to that cross, that old rugged cross, then when the angel of death comes by us, he'll pass over us because we're covered by the blood of Christ. We've been bought with a price, that not of ourselves. So you can't boast. I can't boast. When we have that, that perspective, when we have those kind of thoughts, then when our expectations fail, we won't become disappointed with God. I don't know if you've ever become disappointed with God. Some of you probably have and don't even realize it. I have. There's times when I've even got angry with God. I, 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 you're a bully. I know that's not what you want to hear about your pastor. But hey... That's the, way, that's the way it is. Yeah, I've asked God, why are you picking on me? You know the song, why is everybody always picking on me? I felt that away. Because it was all about me. Because I had certain expectations and I wanted God to meet my expectations even though I didn't meet his. Even though I didn't rise to his level, I wanted him to come through for me, yeah. And when it didn't happen the way that I wanted it to happen, I, I, I sat back and asked questions like some of you have. How many times have we been guilty? We expect a job or a raise or a promotion. We expect something that's going to make us happy. 
for this relationship to work out or that relationship to work out. We expect this kind of grade or this kind of favor. And it doesn't happen. And suddenly, we start pointing at God. We look for joy. We look for peace. And we look every place but the one place that it's really found. Some of us look for joy in the spectacular and the, the flashiness of, of the world. We forget to go to the place where we are alone with God. Because that's where the real joy is. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. The very centerpiece of our lives is that presence of God. That, that's where it'll always be found. You'll never find any lasting joy. You'll never find any lasting peace outside of his presence. I can have joy. I can have peace even in the bitter times. Even when the bottom's falling out. Nehemiah 8.10 says that the joy of the Lord gives you strength. So my duty as a believer is to get to him. Depend on him completely and totally in every situation. Even when it's not going my way. Even when my dreams are crashing. Even when I don't agree with what God is doing. Can you imagine six million people? And that's what most estimate are the, the, the children of Israel. There was about six million of them. Son, that's a big group. That's bigger than this church. In case you hadn't noticed. And they all go up to this little stream. And they're ready to drink because they're thirsty. They had not had anything to drink for three days. My mouth is dry. I could spit a, a dust storm right now. My tongue cleaveth to the top of my mouth. <laughs> Little biblical lingo. And they couldn't because it was bitter. But there was a mess of them that drank. And then they got sick. And I, I, I'm going to close with this. Because I don't want to hold you too late. Y'all get mad at me. Why is everybody always picking on me? <laughs> Listen to this. There was probably many in Israel that drank from that water. And there was probably many that got very sick. Because the water was no good. It was bitter. That's another way, way of saying that it was contaminated. It was no good. Then God shows Moses a tree. And he just throws a stick or wood or a limb, whatever it was, into the river, into that water. And it became sweet. What if you were one of the ones that had gotten really sick? What kind of faith would it take for you to hear, oh, it's okay now? You're not going to be the first to step up and say, let me have another swallow so that I can get sick again. 
How many people have I talked to that says I got hurt by a church and I'm not going to get hurt again? And we don't trust churches. Or, or, or I, I, I'm, I'm not going to get close to any preacher again because I had one that failed me. And it becomes all about us again. And I'm not, I'm not going to trust you or anybody else. And when we have that attitude, how do we trust God? When God is the one that told Moses, throw it in and the waters will be healed. There may be some of you sitting here today that have a hard time letting go and letting God because you've been hurt before. Maybe it was a husband or a wife or, or a mom or a dad or a friend or, or I, I, I don't know. Maybe it was God himself that you feel like hurt you. When Jesus, because of the cross, touches the bitter pool of your life, He'll make it sweet. But you're going to have to trust him to do that. And you're going to have to be willing to drink again. Deeply from God. I just, just heard a testimony from somebody that's been coming to this church. They said, I got hurt. My dad's a pastor. Many years with the Assemblies of God. And he pastored, and I went to church, and the way that things went, it just really, it, it destroyed my heart. And I walked away, and I said, I, I'm not, I'm not going to have anything to do with God. I'm not going to have anything to do with church. And they said, a desperate moment came in my life. And I reached out and I said, God, is there any hope out there? And he said, I went on line and I plugged in Assembly of God in this area. And your church was the first one that popped up. And he said, you, you were preaching a message about the warrior and the widow. And I needed that. I've given my heart back to God. It wasn't easy because of the bitterness that I felt inside of me. Because I had been hurt. Some of you might be there. Listen, when I get to God and I fall at his feet by faith and I say, God, I'll trust you. You show me the way because you've got the answer to every bitter problem in my life. You know, it says in Romans 1.17 that the righteous or the just shall live by faith. When we step out of faith and we begin to walk by feelings or by sight or by our natural senses, we step outside of all that God's blessing. We'll enter the realm of the flesh. And our lives will get more and more and more bitter. And only until we come back into that realm of faith and start trusting God again will the sweetness flood into our soul. Don't give up on God. And don't give up on God's people. We're not perfect. If you've got your eyes on me and putting me on a pedestal, hey, I'm going to fall off that thing and I'm liable to fall on you. 
I, I've never been able to stay on a pedestal. I'll fall off every one that I'm put on. Because, man, I'm flesh. I'm clay. I'm nothing. And so are you. But I'm not what I used to be. Because I got a glue that's trying to hold me together. And his name is Jesus. Stand with me, would you please? I, I, I just feel like that right now, we need to take some steps of faith. Everything in me is wanting you to come forward, but I'm not going to ask you to do that. What I'm going to ask is that if you've been hurt and you've been reluctant to just reach out, I'm going to ask you to give that to God today. I'm going to ask that you will ask God. Throw that wood in the water and let it be sweet. Because the bitterness of my life, I can't handle it anymore. If you've been hurt, then there's a bitterness down inside of you that you need to get rid of. The only way you're going to get rid of it is through him. Give it to him today. If you need to come, because sometimes when you step out and make that little walk, you're putting your faith into action. So if you need to come, you can come. But if, you're, if you will honestly do it where you are, then do it there. But if you need to come, don't, don't let... Don't let 25, 30 feet stop you from getting what God's got for you today. Because it's yours. The waters are sweet. Bow your heads with me, would you please, Father?